we're going to start with licensing. Because so licensing, as everything with Microsoft, is generally one of the more complicated parts. But we're going to make that as easy as we possibly can. So maybe asking, what do you generally use for Teams licensing? Uh, because many of you may know that Teams already can, comes in your general licenses, your business standards, your E3s, your F3s. That's actually going to change here soon. And that's why it's so important to kind of know what Teams features you need and how you're using Teams in your organization, or if you're even going to be using Teams going forward, because that choice, if you're on 365, is going to be very important here shortly. The reason it's going to be important is because as of April 1st, Microsoft, due to pressure from the European Union, has to pull Teams out because Slack is switch owned and they don't like it. Uh, they have to pull Teams out of their corporate offerings. Now, what this means is that the E3s the and Microsoft E3s, the Office E3s, E1s, F5s will no longer exist going forward. Now, you can be grandfathered in if your CSP already has the issue to you, but that is important that if that's not the case, you will no longer here soon be able to purchase these licenses. Instead, they're going to be broken up and you're going to see a no teams option, um, for example, here, uh, because the one with teams will no longer be sold to new subscribers. If you are using Teams and you're not grandfathered in, the way that you'll be able to provide Teams to your users if they're using these enterprise level uh, SKUs is with this Microsoft Teams Enterprise. So they're basically bringing the Teams offering out of the bundles for the enterprise level SKUs. The front lines will continue to exist with Teams. However, there will be an alternative of no Teams for those offerings. So if, for example, you have F3 users, but you know they're not using Teams, you could technically reduce it by 50 cents and remove Teams. These both will exist, and I cannot stress enough, these will not. There is not going to be a Office E3 with Teams and one without. There's only going to be a no Teams, and you will need to purchase this additional add-on for that or be grandfathered in. If you're on the small business SKUs, no real changes. They just get additional offerings for a cheaper version. So this is also why it's important because if you are not using Teams, this is very valuable information because you can technically reduce your cost by moving away from SKUs that include Teams by default. And if you have any questions around any of this, please reach out to us or uh, ping me at the end of this and uh, we'll be more than happy to kind of go over the ins and outs of every, every bit of this. So when, what I'm referring to teams here i mean the users teams licensing basically how your users themselves are able to access teams and the reason i'm clarifying that is user licensing is because there's actually quite a few little teams licenses and i'm going to briefly go over them what they do uh, just so you know which ones you kind of need to go for which ones you don't need um, and you have a rough idea of what you, your organization may need so to start there is uh, the teams enterprise uh, slash essentials that is included in most of the standalone offerings and those are the ones that are being removed from this inherited Office 365 E3. So that is just your general user licensing. Um, then you also have Teams Premium. Now, this is for if you're wanting to do more customization, more control. It uh, allows you to do like a banner in the background. Like when you join this call, I believe there's a, a big green plow banner in the background. That's a Teams Premium option. It allows for more customization past the default settings. Uh, past that, you also have your team's rooms. Now, these are broken down into basic and pro. Um, if you just have a single, uh, uh, what would be the call? A single standalone device um, in your organization, such as like a Yad link, um, a link to any of those, um, those can just use a regular team's basic license, which is free. Um, and that will turn that into a resource account room that you can schedule against and do basic uh, joins with your meetings, auto attendance, stuff like that. Um, however, you cannot do things such as the scheduling uh, wall mount plate on the outside of your conference rooms with just the basic license. You will need a pro license for that, or you can actually get a little cheeky with a team shared device license with that, but we'll get into that next. So the other advantages to Teams Rooms Pro is that it will also allow you to do device analytics. Uh, it'll do auto patching on your actual devices itself. So it's basically just the next level up. But really, unless you're doing a ton of conference rooms where you need a centralized kind of management to keep them all patched and to keep them all monitored, as well as that like additional customizations, Teams Rooms Basics pretty much going to work for the vast majority of your use cases. Unless you, you would like something like a outside kind of scheduling, outside the door, anything like that, then we're going to kind of talk into what's called Teams Shared Device Licenses. So they're not listed here. Um, but there is a license called a Teams Shared Device. 
Um, these are generally used for common area phones, quick huddle rooms, and they can, as mentioned, they can be combined with a team's basic license, which is free, uh, to set up like a scheduling panel outside of your environment, outside of your conference rooms. Um, the team share device licenses are eight dollars a piece. They are not free like the team's room basic, um, but that is still better than the uh, pro license at forty dollars. So just be very mindful of that because I don't want you spending up a whole pro license just to get a calendar on the wall um, because it's not needed. Uh, that license is for much more complex things. All right, past that, we only got a couple more licenses. There's the team's resource account that you may see in your environment that's purely used for auto attendance and for service accounts holding the IDs around team's phones. And then lastly, you have your actual team's phone and your calling plans. Uh, this basically will just enable uh, PSTN connectivity, uh, meaning you can dial landlines, cell phones, regular phones uh, from your actual team's device. This also means that you would generally be assigned a DID or an external number or an extension, allowing people to also call into you. And then absolutely dead last is the audio conferencing. Uh, you may have licenses around audio conferencing in your environment. I'm going to touch on this very briefly because Microsoft, in my opinion, kind of dropped the ball very significantly on this. They announced a few years ago that all audio conferencing would be folded into Teams and it would become a free offering. However, instead of actually doing that, they instead released a different SKU that's free and kept the old one as a $4 payment. So can't stress this enough. If you are paying it up at all for your audio conferencing licensing, hit us up or anybody else up and switch those out to the free ones because they were supposed to be free and included it into Teams and they just never got around to it. So it's just been a standalone free audio conferencing SKU. All right. So in terms of maximizing your team's usage and licensing, obviously focus on the ones that are most important to you. In terms of if you're using teams in your environment, it may be better if, for example, if you're not using teams to use a SKU that don't include teams to reduce your cost. If you are, be very mindful of those teams changes as you may want to grandfather yourself in because it may be a little bit more expensive after those changes. So to be somewhat mindful of that because there is a big teams change coming. All right, so let's kind of get into teams workloads, what they kind of do, how to approach them, all that. So we're going to start with what teams actually does, and then we're going to kind of go into the administration of it, how you can actually see your usage, how you can set your policies um, and where to kind of focus, as well as the, the, the large action items that any environment would want to double check prior to rolling this out. And that's going to be things like your external access, um, you know, things like because there's some default settings that will go in that you may want to double check. First. All right. In terms of workloads, now obviously Teams being a collaboration platform, um, the whole idea is that you're able to communicate with your coworkers. Um, what many people don't realize off the rip is that the by default, anyone within Office 365 licensed for Teams can be communicated with anybody else who's also in 365 and licensed for Teams. For example, if you were to spin up Teams right now and send Plow.net a message, I will get it. We do not disable external access or external communications here at Plow, although that is an option. Um, but I want to stress that this is a widespread um, company used cross platform, you know, cross organizational communication tool. Um, if, for example, you send an email to somebody and I hit you up, pay them on Teams. Um, it's a good, good example of alternate uh, mediums of communication when you need a more abrupt answer. Other than that, past chat calls are also a very large part of this. Uh, so going back to those Teams phones, you have the ability to provide uh, telephony services to your users. Um, so you can kind of see here, for example, we have many numbers that are currently issued to our users. They're able to dial out. People are able to dial into them. Additionally, we have auto attendance. And I want to stress here, if you are thinking of using Teams as a phone, as a PBX system, it is great so long as you don't have excessive like call center needs or excessive routing needs. Um, if you need to do just kind of like basic routings, you know, an auto tenant push three for sales, four for engineering, that's perfectly fine. Um, you actually get a little bit more advanced than that. Uh, but you wouldn't, for example, ever attempt to replace a call center with a Teams PBX. Please don't try to do that. You're going to want to pull your hair out. All right. So, and then the last piece in terms of workloads before we get into like collaboration and actually start going into channels versus Teams is the actual applications. Inside of Teams, there's additional applications that can be rolled out. And so let me give you a good example of this. And all of these can be seen within the Teams Admin Center here, where you're able to set which ones are allowed to be used and which ones aren't. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up uh, our Teams real quick. 
and just kind of show you a good example of a few of these elements. So to start, let's just kind of go over the general structure. So within Microsoft Teams, they're all broken down into your actual teams themselves and then individual channels. So for example, we have here, this is our Plow Networks general chat. You can kind of see here we have happy birthdays messages kind of going out to everyone. You can see everyone kind of communicating with them. This is a team and each individual aspect underneath it is a channel. So think of channels is pretty much individual chats, but where it gets a little bit more complicated is that they also have their addition, their own file storage as well as their own options to be pinned. We'll kind of get into the pinning here very shortly once we get into the apps. Uh, but let's kind of run through these kind of app examples for you. So one good example of an app that we use here at Plow, for example, is our organizational chart. So let's kind of show you this. Uh, what this does is just give the entire company a very quick and understandable way to view our current organizational chart. This is a good example of an app that would be rather difficult to roll out or implement outside of Teams, but because it's already pulled from Azure AD, because it's already pulling uh, auth, sorry, pulling all your pictures, everything's already within the 365 environment, it's able to produce this relatively easily. And that's what's really important around the apps that are possible within Teams, is if you are functioning within the 365 environment, it can be extremely advantageous. So how then do we actually go about kind of monitoring and seeing our users? Are they using this? What apps are they using? Where do we kind of go to see if Teams are even in use? And the reason I'm going to kind of start here as well is it's very important to point out that there is a shadow IT component to this by default in 365 tenants. Anybody can make a new team. That's that may be fine with your organization. It may not be. That's very important to know because um, by default, you can spin up new teams and you can uh, basically start working in those environments. That, and if you're under a strict IT governance policy, but it's not been technically implemented yet, you're going to have a huge cleanup project to have to do later on, and it's not going to be fun. All right, so in terms of actually seeing who's using what, we can come down here to the Teams Admin Center, and we go down to our usage reports. Now, these are extremely valuable for quite a few different reasons. One, you can kind of see um, if, for example, any of your users are using the premium features. So if they do have a Teams premium license, you can check the support to see if any of them are using it. And if not, pull the license out because you're just wasting money. Uh, additionally, you can kind of see if they've made calls, uh, you can also see, obviously, your, your general team's usage uh, to make sure people are actually using it and kind of go through your staff to see, you know, which channels, which person uh, is using each one. So let's do user activity. And this gives you a really good way to kind of see who is and isn't using teams who may need those kind of licenses uh, or any kind of guest accounts who may be over allocated, et cetera. Uh, apps usage as well. So you can kind of see if there's any apps within your environment that are being used relatively often. Um, so you can kind of see here, org charts used pretty often, OneNote is used often, and then we use Poly uh, and Power BI. So that kind of shows you just how easy it is to determine which apps are actually used in your environment. That's kind of important. If you are going to go down a governance rap, uh, rabbit hole of implementing safeguards, you're going to want to kind of limit down the apps that they can and can't use. And this can kind of give you a good starting point of, okay, they're using the, these. I can go ahead and investigate all of those, allow, add them to the allowed policy once confirmed that they're good. And then you, you won't cause much interruption by disabling the new addition of apps because you already have the ones in use covered. So kind of going in ah, before we get into policies, let's check on how to actually determine our call quality, because that is also a concern around, especially if you're doing any PSTN dialing. Um, going back to we have a call quality dashboard here. Um, what this is is a collection of all the data points um, that have been gathered when a user makes a call. And they say this is a great call, it's a terrible call, it's a poor call. And it kind of gives you a good uh, way to check on a per client basis um, if one of your locations has an issue. Because obviously, if you see a high data point of bad calls from one of your locations um, or multiple users, you may have a networking related issue out there. Um, additionally, it can also tell you if uh, someone's home network, if, for example, they're working from home, uh, may have network issues. Uh, all right, so let's. Now we got a call quality. Let's go into policies. So going back to our Teams administration, policies are assigned to the users, created individually, but they can be packaged. And so I'm going to go through that uh, step by step because that can be a little odd at first, but 
just bear with me. So to start, we're going to go on a per user basis. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down here and I'm actually going to find myself. And we can actually see what policies I currently have assigned. Okay, so you can kind of see here, these are all the different kind of policies that you're able to set on a user within Teams. It's everything from how live events are handled, uh, to individual meetings, to uh, external guest access, to who's, am I allowed to use emojis during chat? Um, am I able to create new teams? For example, uh, how is my voice calls routing? Am I using an SPC for direct routing? Am I using uh, calling plans for Microsoft services? Am I using an operator connect? So all of that set individual level. Uh, now, in here, you're only able to set which policy is applied to the user. So each one of these also has to be modified themselves. So for example, if we were to go to the directional access policies here, we can kind of see here that we're allowing all external domains. So this is that default setting I was mentioning at the start of this that allows other users and other organizations, if they've been confirmed, to message your users. Now, you don't have to worry so much about spam as you would probably think because they do get a a rather large kind of warning saying this person's from outside. You've never talked to them before. You want to see what they have to say. Uh, so don't think that they can just kind of send them pornography or anything weird like that. Uh, but that's what that setting's for. If you do want to control that and only allow certain domains, you can obviously set that to only allow certain. Um, you can also block only certain domains. Um, so if you do have multiple environments, multiple tenants, you can lock them down and then just add the other domains from the other tenant into your policies and you can easily communicate across. Uh, no problems, but no one else can really communicate with you or your other organization. Then we also have personal Teams accounts. I have no idea why Microsoft keeps trying so hard to slam personal accounts into organizational accounts, but here we are. Uh, both Skype personal accounts and Teams personal accounts have access to message your users unless turned off here. Again, this is on by default, so it's something to keep in mind. All right, going to our, let's do messaging policies next. Fast meeting policies are funner. All right, meeting policies. All right, so here's where we're able to set the different policies around meetings. Um, so we're going to do is to check into our default one. This is where we pretty much can set um, if we're allowing Meet Now, if we're allowing the Outlook add in, for example, who all can register the attendees' information. Can people join past the lobby? Should they have to wait? Can they be let in? Um, and this is where you get kind of really granular in terms of how your organization handles Teams meetings. So this is where it's really important to, as an organization, define your policies and procedures and what you're going to allow and not allow within your organization. And that, again, that's everything from can the users create their own teams? Can they communicate outside of our organization? Can external people reach out to them? Um, all these things are very, very important, especially if dealing with any kind of sensitive information. Now, the beauty of this is that because it is within this environment, if you do have those kind of complex governance policies and those complex needs, you, you'd be much better off with this than you would trying to shoehorn in slack in that kind of scenario. I'll just say it that way. Um, because yeah, they're just meant for two different demographics. All right, uh, let's see. So we went over policy change, ah, stupid packages. So as you can kind of see here, you're able to go into meetings or chats and set your different messaging policies. You do have your default here, so uh, custom emojis, things can use GIFs and what the rating is for them. But obviously, it would be kind of a pain to go through each user, and especially if you have a ton of these uh, to apply, they can get kind of complex. So we have what's called policy packages. So this is where you're basically able, and they do have a bunch of these that come default, but you're basically able to create your own policies into a batch and then just assign that to the user. So it makes it much, much easier to divide up your users because you may have different requirements for different staff in your environment. For example, you may not want your frontline users to be able to create their own teams, but you may want your back office staff to do so. Um, that's where you would kind of put those kind of policies in place. Yeah, and then basically after you make the policy, add into the package, and then you can assign that package uh, to your users. So in terms of building out your teams. There are three elements around a team's design. Now, again, this is going to depend greatly on your organization. I can't stress that enough. These are purely just three examples of teams implementations that I have seen work well. Uh, one is to just mimic your existing organizational structure. Um, that is just pretty much your departmentalized teams. Uh, 
your executive team, you know, your accounting team, basically mimicking your existing organizational structure. I'm sure everyone's already thought of that, so it should be that surprising. The next one's going to be on a per project or a cross departmental project level. Um, basically, if you do have a new initiative being spun up, um, either company wide, departmental wide, and only requires a certain amount of people, that's a good example of when to bring uh, teams into it um, and to form a new team. So, for a uh, just using purely for example, we have like our um, AI service dispatcher we're using um, that we built here at Plow. That's a good example of putting that within like our STC team, which is our support, so that uh, the support people are able to see what's going on, what the AI actually assigned them, how it was handled, all of that. Um, and that's a good example of kind of cross departmental because it's a developmental effort, but it's related to our support teams so it's in the sdc champ so, and so that's why i kind of mean it's really important to kind of keep that in mind that you have a general overarching hierarchy of teams like accounting tech you know it executives name your department but that's not where the limitations stop if for example you have another initiative in your organization you need to roll out and you need say two people from marketing two people from development two engineers and two salespeople. You can just easily create a new team with that initiative, throw them all in there, and they have a secure and safe way to work together on the same files to communicate around those issues and objectives and goals that they're working towards in a secure and safe way that works no matter where they are. And I think that's really the important piece to all of this, especially if you're coming from like a legacy kind of, I got to connect to my VPN to access company resources. It's dramatically different. Um, when a new initiative is spun up, everyone's kind of added to teams and everyone's working within that um, because everyone has access to co-author the same files. You have live communications. You can also bring in apps such as to-do list uh, and you can kind of run with it. Now, uh, in terms of Teams policies, keep in mind, I did mention the external communications, uh, this external access here. That's very important, especially depending on your company policies. Uh, also, e-discovery and retention policies do apply to Teams. Um, meaning if you do have a retention policy of say 60, 90 days, that does apply fully to teams. Um, another good reason uh, for using teams if you have those kind of requirements. Uh, and just know e-discovery also applies there as well. And lastly, can be used like a map drive if one drive is in use. Now this is gonna get a little bit outside of just raw teams as it's somewhat into endpoint, but I wanna make sure um, that it's shown. Um, if I bring over uh, my teams, for example, you'll see that I have this, uh, my our dev team six. Um, but you may see that we have, there are files here. And normally you'd have to kind of work from within this kind of like files area uh, within teams, but you don't really actually have to do that. Um, you can actually map it like it's a map drive. So if you do have one drive on your user's workstations and you should, and I can't stress it enough, use one drive, use known folder move. Set it up to log in automatically. It's awesome. Um, then you can use that OneDrive client to actually map those exact same files within the workstation. Now, it's not a map map drive because you kind of see here it just says Plow Networks and it handles it very similar to OneDrive because um, it is actually using the OneDrive client. So it only has the references until I go to access it. But this also fully supports the co authoring. And so what you can end up doing, especially if you're moving more towards like a modern workplace, zero trust environment. You know, you don't want your people having to connect to the VPN, just get to their map drives. If it's mostly Office documents and whatnot, you are able to move those into either a team or a SharePoint um, and have those mapped on the workstation instead. And then it just works no matter where they are um, and actually rides through the Azure AD auth, which I personally like a lot better than using a password on a VPN. Because you can do because you can do conditional access against it. It can follow that same zero trust model. It doesn't matter where they are, you know they're on a known and trusted device that's yours and is up to up to compliance standards. And that's why it's so important. All right. Next, we're going to go into some of the challenges using Teams and and what to kind of be on the mind, be on the lookout for. So we talked briefly about the hierarchy around your teams, about how you can have it done either departmentally, like we do with like Mercury Path, Service Pass, Dev Teams, um, as well as kind of initiative based, such as like our AI initiative uh, or certain projects, such as SOC 2 rollout. Um, those are all great examples of when to make new teams, but you want to be mindful of by default that users can make their own teams. And if that's not something you're okay with, you need to turn that off. Uh, 
because I've not yet seen one organization that allowed their users to make teams that didn't go and make a bunch of teams. Um, that's not necessarily a terrible thing. It just might be something you have to clean up later if you are going to lock that down. Microsoft's pers- Microsoft's suggestion, however, and I have to say this because it's the opposite of mine, is to actually leave it that way. They prefer people to make their own teams because the way they see it is the initiatives and the projects are so dynamic and so fluid that uh, they don't want them to have to kind of go through the, the legwork to make a new team with approval and all that. But if you do have strict governance policies, then obviously that's going to be what they have to do. According to Microsoft, they prefer that you didn't. But I think that's just because they need teams usage numbers, to be honest with you. But let's see then kind of how we're able to manage our apps, what all they're used for. So inside of your Teams Admin Center, you have your little manage apps area. And this will basically list out all the different apps um, within Teams. Now, you can also make your own team apps if need be. Um, but you can kind of come in here and see what all is here. Now, there's going to be a lot because one of the main advantages to Teams is that integration with Office 365. So, for example, you could have Power BI dashboards pinned inside of your team channels, which is very useful if you have a company initiative um, that's trying to accomplish some certain goal. And that goal is already uh, been defined by a metric that you can see within Power BI or uh, because then you can just put it all into one nice little channel, know exactly where you're at, uh, know where that initiative is because of the latest conversations. You can bring people into it. They can kind of catch up. Uh, So very useful. Obviously, you can tie also into your Power Apps, your workflows. Um, so I highly suggest kind of go through here and kind of look and see hey, if certain ones of these could be useful for certain use cases, because there's quite a lot you can do in here. Probably, for example, is just to get uh, polls out there and to get responses back from your users in either an anonymous or tracked way. And again, going back, if you do need to figure out which apps are in use, like it's already in production, but you want to lock it down, you're going to have to use those analytics and reports and get your app usage reports. Because you can kind of see here, we currently are not blocking any of these apps. Uh, but you are able to go in here and only allow certain ones to be allowed, certain ones not to be allowed, and limit it that way. Um, another kind of important aspect to this, uh, to Teams, going back to that whole kind of um, everything under one roof kind of setup, is you have these pins up here that you're able to do. So you can kind of see all these pins. Those kind of be individual files. They can be individual uh, links within your organization. They can even be individual apps. And so it can get a little bit confusing, but if you have any questions, let us know. But for example, within our Mercury Path General, we have our feature matrix pinned here just for quick, you know, checks against some licensing feature. Um, and you can kind of see how all this can kind of play together. If, if everybody in here is working around the 365 offerings or, you know, assisting customers with 365 features, you can kind of see why these, these would be so important. One other question, but I'm going to take me one second to find it, is the... AI integrations within Teams, because I want to show you all the possibilities there before we move on to next area. In short, they are currently releasing more and more features around Copilot uh, within Teams. Um, its biggest advantage within Teams is to, if you record and transcribe your meeting, it will keep track of everyone's action items, what the summaries were, and give you a nice little summary uh, and timestamps and transcribed and uh, point of topic indexes for that entire meeting um it's pretty much like you had a personal note taker who took their job way too seriously standing by and listening the entire time it is very very useful um i wish i had one i could show you that didn't have some information in it uh, i will prepare one for the next one um and i might be able to find one for the end of this but we'll see all right so going into the next one we're going to kind of talk about the new features that are coming into teams So Microsoft is constantly updating Teams. I cannot stress that enough. If you are on Teams, you may notice that you have a uh, new Teams area up here, this new Teams button. They are constantly releasing new features for Teams, and I cannot stress that enough. You will be updating almost every other day. It almost feels like nowadays. I understand that they're making a whole bunch of new features and having more directly integrated with Copilot, but it's definitely kind of annoying. Uh, Now, granted, your update policies can also be set in here, and obviously, us being Plyo, we are on the latest Keep up to date all the time, which is why we're kind of seeing those. Um, but for example, let me uh, show you that about how you're able to manage those updates on your users. So if I go to self again, and we're going to go to our policies and go all the way down here to Teams update policy. So you can kind of see here, I'm on the newest Teams client policy, uh, which basically forces them by default. Now, they're going to force you over eventually anyway, uh, but you basically kind of want to be ahead of this. 
Um, anyone who is familiar with the whole Skype for business transition into teams and was familiar with that whole islands versus uh, teams only migration and how much of a annoying cluster that that was and that the answer ended up being just hard flip it to teams. I kind of suggest that on the new teams client as well. Um, flip yourself teams only, keep your teams updated. Just don't worry about it. So we went over what teams actually is. That's part of the 365 family. It provides real-time collaboration communications. We went over the team's license changes. And again, that's super important if you are going to be using Teams, thinking about using Teams, or even if you are using Teams, um, basically, if you're on this call, this is important. Uh, <laughs> teams is being pulled out of Office 365, E1, E3, and E5, and Microsoft E1, E3, E5. And that's very, very important. You can get grandfathered in if you already have one of those, but here very shortly, that's it. Um, and you will either have to pay an additional uh, add-on price or you have a slightly reduced price because it won't have that functionality unless you're on a small business SKU. All right. uh, we also went over uh, the different teams' workloads, uh, the different practices you can do with it, how channels and teams kind of function, as well as the different ways to divide them up between either departmental, uh, adhering to your company hierarchy, or alternatively, uh, tying it more into company projects or initiatives that you're trying to accomplish that may require people from different departments, which I would argue is one of its greatest strengths. Um, we also went over analytics and usage reporting, so you kind of see how often your users are using it, uh, which applications they're using. So if you do want to lock that down post um, kind of Teams rollout, because I know some people may be kind of behind the ball there, um, especially since Teams has been around for a while, you may already be in an environment where Teams is widely used, and in order to lock it down, you run the risk of causing an interruption. Um, those usage analytics reports are very, very useful in preventing that because you can see what apps people are using. You can see who's actually using what, how many, who's hosting the meetings. Um, also, that those usage analytics are very useful for if, for example, you want to use the team's premium uh, customization of a uh, company background when people join your team's meetings. Um, you could use the usage analytics to see who in your environment is actually hosting the meetings because those are the ones that need the license, not anybody else. So you can use those usage analytics uh, to kind of accomplish a lot of things around what pieces of teams are used in your environment. All right, and then we also kind of went over the new features that are being kind of added into Teams. Those are mostly Copilot at the moment. Microsoft is pushing very, very hard for Copilot uh, integration into Teams. Um, if you are playing with it right now, just know the one that's within Teams has access to more areas, it seems, than most of the other ones, um, at least the ones out of Outlook and Word don't seem to have nearly as much access. And yeah, we went over policy 